and welcome to the second Ronnie O'Sullivan Show, a World Championship special. Coming up, Ronnie gives us the lowdown on his incredible performance at the Crucible last year. You get to the point where you go, this is mine. He heads to the Star Snooker Academy in Sheffield. Everybody that comes in wants to play like you. You know, it must be crazy. Well, <laughs> that's what I tell them. There's another masterclass. Great building, it's about trying to play shots nice and firm so you can be positive with it. And talks us through one of his greatest ever breaks. If I set that up now, you wouldn't be able to do it again. You'd have your life on it, mate. <laughs> Ronnie O'Sullivan's career has been full of memorable moments. Five world titles, five masters, four UK championships, a total of 26 ranking event victories, plus 12 magical 147s. But perhaps his greatest ever break wasn't a century. This incredible display of potting and cue ball control came during the 2012 world final against Ali Carter. Andy Goldstein popped over to Ronnie's London flat to get the full rundown on this remarkable break. I wanted to get your view on this because it's from a couple of years ago in the final of the World Championships against Ali Carter. It's 3-3, so it's early on in the match. Yeah. And um, if you haven't seen it already, a, a lot of people do now regard this, even more so than Alex Ings' wonderful break of 69 <laughs> from 1982 against Jimmy in the semi, as the greatest break of snooker ever, not just at the World Championship. I don't mm. want to embarrass you too much, but it is. From a fan's point of view, it is. Just looking at the table now when you come to it, mm. if you haven't seen this frame, you won't believe when I say they all disappear in one break. <laughs> Which is, because even if I set that up now, I think I'm fair to say that you wouldn't be able to do it again. You'd have your life on it, mate. <laughs> I'd, have my, I'd have my life on it that you wouldn't clear up from there because obviously the green's tough, these are campered, the black's tied up, you've got four reds all along the cushion that just don't go. I mean, this doesn't go, and it goes if you get there. Yeah. This doesn't go, and if you get there, this doesn't go unless you get there. And once you take that one, then you can only take that one, and that one goes, but it's down the road. Yeah. Then you've got to get these out. So that blue's only ball. Potentially, the there's like seven or eight balls that you just. So what are you thinking? Sixteen, you are you thinking if I can knock it a twenty? I mean, what's... yeah. Now to be honest, I was thinking, right, I've got one, two, three, four, five reds there. So I'm thinking five reds with blues. You're looking at twenty-five. If I can get a forty-point lead okay. with fifty-nine on, yellow's pretty safe. At some point, I'm going to have to get that out, but I want to try and keep it tight, you know? Well, with a 40-point line, you, you, you don't really want the black out in play. So all I'm thinking of is, is just trying to make build a lead here. Um, and I remember, oh, I got the green out early there. So that wasn't even... That, Why did you play that, then? Well, because I don't know, really. <laughs> and I didn't, I didn't play it very well, because this green was a hard shot. And if you know, I don't know if you noticed on my face there, I've got all sort of like little spots. I was sick on the morning of the final. And you don't look well, actually. No, I was really ill. I couldn't eat, I, and I'd been spewing up all, all morning. I didn't eat the whole day of the first final. But anyway, so that, that green wasn't an easy shot, um, but I thought I've got to go for it, because, you know, he's presented me with the opportunity. Yeah, so... Fine. And it's kind of like, I've kind of cleaned these balls up here. The green was safe, the brown was off its spot, the red was there. So I've played f to clean this area of the table up, really. Because you never like coming to the table and browns here, greens here, yellows here. It always looks a bit untidy. So you, because you're a bit OCD, yeah. the break happened? Yeah, possibly. That's what, yeah, my <laughs> mate my Damien said to me, he said, I think you've got, um, what does he call that disease? A bad like, memory? Okay. Well, whatever. Anyway, so I'll get, I, I've just, yeah. now it's important just to get the right side of here. Mm. Now there's a chance because you've got to go into there, into these, but then you're chancing to so, luck. And so I never like to chance to luck. So and then here it's like, important to try and get the right angle, you know, and stay above the red. So as your white's coming this way, and I'm not going into these balls. But can he get right side of the blue now? This wasn't an easy shot, because they're not big. And, and at pace as like, well. Yeah, yeah, at pace, yeah, because obviously I wanted to get it off the cushion. I don't like leaving myself near the cushion. But when you're playing well, you can sort of pop balls with pace. I was hitting the ball that well that I just see this as a challenge. I used to think, right, the balls were like really not great here, but I fancy I can clear up. I didn't think I was going to clear up, but the challenge is to, to think, well, let's see how far I can this, get. This is the shot that made this it all possible. Shot, yeah, this yeah. is an amazing shot. And that looks to be end of break, unless he plays the brown. The, the people don't realise that with a shot like this, although you're trying to pot the ball, the most important thing is, is that once the white hits there and gets there, that is automatic. Whereas if I get that bit wrong, you're never getting on this red. Mm. And that's why when they say, say about players like Stephen Hendry and John Higgins, they're so good at break building, is that they get these shots right all the time because that kind of, you watch the white will just drift into here. Whereas if I didn't hit it so good, the white would have drifted into here. And then you kind of like, got to play safe. 
So these shots are just all about getting that bit right. Once you get that bit right, the rest of it just happens naturally. And it looks like a shot you really enjoy playing as well. Yeah, I love this shot. What a great positional shot. Inch perfect. So is that annoying that you flick that red onto the other one? No, line? no, because... You did that to get the angle on the white. Yeah, the bit of the okay. angle. Look at the reverse side, right-hand side on the cue ball. He still needs another red after this blue. So I kind of like thought, right, well, I'll try and disturb that one, bring it out and open. If I miss that one, then I cannon that one out. But when you're playing so well, that you just see that shot so big. Oh, I didn't even realise this one went. See, I'm making it up as I go along. Is that, I mean, you're, you're nearly popping into a blind pocket there. Is yeah. that such a difficult shot? Is it so much more difficult? Yeah, but it's one of them. You just have to <coughs> get on the shot and go, right, there's my white, there's the ball, and I'm just going to hit that line. I'm not even going to look at the pocket. I'm just going to hit it well. When you're, um, when you're down on a shot... Yeah. Are you, is the last ball you look at the cue ball or the object ball? Uh, I don't even know, to be honest with you. No? No, I don't even know. You just I do suppose it. it's meant to be the object ball, but I, sometimes I find myself looking at the white. This was a shot there that, that I think everybody was going on about, was the, um, the brand here. This I, is the shot everyone's going to think yeah, about, you're right, yeah. Yeah, because I think I, try, I sort of tried to leave my white there so as I can go in there for the... For, but then I, I thought, well, there's no other ball that can get these reds out. And I was seeing, and it, again, it's like the brand shot that I was telling you before. If you get this bit right, if you get this bit right, that sort of takes care of itself. So as long as you get a good strike on it, and the white sort of arcs its way over there, then oh, that, that, that angle was always on. But you have to create the angle. You, you, don't, the, have to, you don't have to sling it in, do you? I mean, it's no. a nice gentle shot. I mean, it's beautiful. I mean, they couldn't come out much better than no. that. Well, he's a magician. I don't think the red goes past the other one. Oh, I sit corrected. <laughs> Wonderful stuff. And then I think it was about here, I just thought, you know, I just want to clear the table now. Do you now, even looking back, think, wow, that's pretty amazing? That was a good clearance, yeah. I mean, from where the balls were, I mean, it just wasn't on at all. But I just remember feeling so good about my game that no matter where the balls were, I just fancied I was going to be able to make a few. And does it make a difference because it was a clearance where it was, it made it outstanding to you? I think, yeah, of course it's a clearance, in it? I mean, it's a nice feeling. You know, the balls are in such awkward positions. And that's, you know, anyone that comes to the table tell well, I'll just be happy to make maybe three or four balls. But to, to clear them all up, that was like, yeah, I was really... Is that your best 92? Yeah, ever, <laughs> mate, yeah, don't get any better than that. It doesn't. <laughs> brilliant. That really was a brilliant clearance from Ronnie O'Sullivan. Wonderful stuff. Coming up in part two, Ronnie heads to the Star Snooker Academy in Sheffield, and in the second instalment of his masterclass, he looks at the art of break building. Don't go away. Welcome back. Since 1977, Sheffield has been the home of the World Championship, but since 2003, it's also been the home for many of the game's top players from around the world. Ronnie went along to the Star Snooker Academy in Sheffield to find out a bit more about the facility and meet some of the players who practice there. Keith, how are you doing? Um, Can you just tell us a bit about the academy? Yeah, the main role for the academy is to take care and look after the overseas players because mm. when they get their place on the main tour, mm. they're a bit lost, really. They don't know yeah. what, how they're going to do, where they're going to live in the UK, where yeah. they're going to practice. So we like to make them feel at home. And then before long, they don't want to leave. Ding's our resident professional, the number mm. one pro. He's been with us mm. ever since he came to the UK when yeah. he was 15, which is a good role model for all the others. How many hours do you play a day? Sometimes eight, sometimes, sometimes seven. Eight, seven, eight hours, yeah. Practice hard to be like you, be the best. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> have a game one day, yeah? When I get, okay. get practising for Sheffield, we'll come, okay. I'll give you a session, yeah? Okay, thank you. If I don't join first round of the World Championship, quite in balls like that. <laughs> nice to meet you. Yep. How are you? You all right? Fine, thank you. Do you know Tong Sin Choi? Tong Sin Choi. Tong Sin Choi, Jang Katana. When I first went to Thailand when I was young, yeah. Tong Sin Choi was number one or two in the world. Yeah. He was like Michael Jackson over there. I'd never seen someone get so much attention. That result getting to India, the final, yeah. seems like you're a big time, you know, you, you, you're comfortable being in the big matches? Yeah, definitely. Um, more comfortable for sure and more experienced and 
I'm learning every day. You know, we've got great players at this academy. So I think the, the main focus for me has always been to improve, you know, to just keep learning and try and get the best I can out of myself. So if, if when the results come and if they come, you know, I'm really happy. But mm. I know there's a lot more work to be done as well. You've got a great setup here. I know you look after the coaching side, you looked after Ding for 10 years. You see Ding for the first time. What did you think? You knew it was special. I mean, the first time we brought Ding over from China, he'd come for six weeks to practice with Peter Ebden before the World Champs. The year Peter won it, and he just bashed Peter up. Peter had admit it, he bashed him up for six weeks um, every day. So you knew he, he had class, but, it, but he had something about him. You know, the way he walks around the table is important. Mm. His knowledge of the balls, the knowledge of the pace he goes into the balls, the little cannons, the touches. Mm. As you know, you know that's, that's special and that's hard to teach as well. You need to build up a relationship as well. They need to trust you. Um, experience helps. You know, if you've been there, done it to a certain level. I think there's a lot of coaches out there that haven't experienced that. So, you know, if you're just about to walk out of the World Championships and go through that curtain, you know your backside's on the floor. You know, how do you, <laughs> how do you prepare someone for that? You know, you know so, so just talking them through, Given experiences that, that you've had or that they've had and forgot about. Mm. I know you're working closely with Dieter now. Yeah. How has he taken it on board? He was one that was playing loads of hours, but not really understanding why he was mm. playing them hours. Yeah. So I'd They're rather like junk play. snooker in a way. Yeah, exactly. You know, turning up and playing for four hours, hitting balls around is not the same as doing an hour quality, mm. and then assessing what you've actually achieved during that hour. He was always going to go. That's right. <laughs> You've gone for the right shot, you've played the right shot, you've got a bit of luck. When you see top players in big games yeah. and you see how precise they are, you think, oh, maybe I need to be that precise. Nah, nah forget no. that precise. You've got options. Biggest bugbear for me is um, everybody that comes in wants to play like you. You know, they must be crazy. Well, <laughs> that's what I tell them. That's the first I'm thing trying to play like everybody else. Anyone else is trying to play exactly. like me? Exactly. They obviously want to run around the table and yeah. balls, but you can do it. Not everyone mm. can do it. Mm. You know. So that's the hardest thing for a coach, really. When you've got the top players that we need, of course they want to be like them. Yeah. But these young kids, they don't know how lucky they are. Mm. From when we played, stuck in snooker clubs and whatever, to come now to an academy where not only the elite are here, but mm. you know the environment's correct mm. and, and people are thinking correctly. Mm behaving correctly. Mm. The, the old style players, you know, they were winning, they were doing stuff. Their lifestyles were different. Mm. You can't compete in the modern no. world like that. Mm. And snooker's got to go like other sports. Mm. You've got to be physically fit. Mm. You've got to be thinking the right things. Mm. You've got to be eating the right mm. things. I'd use you as an example on the fitness side. Mm. You know, you'd use other players on the, on the mental strength, mm. you know, and, and others on their, on their cue ball mm. control. And, and, you know, you're just trying to pick out Mm. what's right and then can you implement it in that player and yeah. package it up package it up and then wrap and it up and send it out there go. and then the crucible. and then even go and bring it bring and it then watch it go <laughs> <laughs> but no <laughs> cheers mate thanks for talking yeah, to us pleasure thank you Now we're going to move on to the break building phase, which is, in my opinion, is the most important part of the game. If you don't score big breaks, you can't win frames. And if you can't win frames, you can't win competitions. So for me, this is vitally important to get this part of the game right. It's a very, very simple shot, but my philosophy was always behind playing simple shots well. And if you play simple shots well, in theory, you should never really have to play a difficult shot. I'm going to run you through the shot here. I have the black off the spot. I have the white nicely behind it and I'm going to try and just follow it in off one, two cushions. And the aim of it is to try and bring our white out into the middle of the table because leaving your white in a cushion is never a good idea. So the aim is to kind of try and get a good solid contact on the white and making sure that we're kind of in this kind of area. Here I go. Somewhere above the centre of the white. And we want to kind of keep it so as you stay there, and as you follow through, you kind of release the white and let it just flow. That was the screw back shot there. And as you've noticed, what I was trying to do there was just trying to address the cue ball slightly below centre. Still trying to keep the cue parallel, but this time we were kind of trying to get a bit of zip into the white to create the backspin. And once you get the backspin, the idea of good backspin is when it, it kind of has a delayed reaction. So you kind of hit the object ball, 
the black goes in the hole and then the white takes a little delay and then it accelerates back. That to me is the idea of a good backspin. Once you get the control of a good backspin, you can hit it firm, but yet with control. Then breaks will become that much easier to score. The game will become that much more simpler. And from then on, you can start looking at making 147s. I'm now going to show you a great break building exercise. This is one a lot of the top professionals do. Five reds between the pink and black. And what we're going to try and do is take red, black, red, black, red, black. And each time leaving ourselves a perfect angle on the black to make it easy to get to our next red. So here we go, we're queuing up, kind of in the middle of the white, just below centre. Little screw back. Now here is one of the shots that I would call a key shot and it's called like a stun run through. So here I get down, I'm always in the middle of the white. There you see, I've potted the black, left myself a nice angle on this red. For me about break building, it's about trying to play Shot's nice and firm, so you can be positive with it. So we go down for this red, middle of the white. Nice little follow through. Leave myself a nice little angle on the black to then, again, bring my white across here. This is like a soft screw, so again, just below center. Little soft screw. Leave ourselves this angle onto the red. Again, we've got the perfect angle on the red. We're gonna try and pot this red, leave ourselves a nice angle on the black, which I've managed to do. And again, I'm gonna try and come off this top cushion, and leave myself here. Always leave myself options. So you've got two reds here, so I kinda of wanna make sure my white's here and not here. So if I go a bit too far for this one, I've always got this one here. So again, I'm gonna be in the middle of the white for the black, and it's just all of that. Delivery of the cue, keeping it nice and firm, but under control. And as you can see there, I've left myself two options. I can play the bottom red or the top red, whatever I fancy. So again, I'm gonna play the top red, because it suits me on this shot. Once you start playing them shots regular, you start to feel much more confident with your striking of where you're gonna get the cue ball. Your positional play will improve that much better. And that, will, again, will enable you to score breaks at much less, with much less effort, the game can be easy then, sometimes. Still to come, we hear Ronnie's take on his World Championship success 12 months ago. Don't go away. After winning his fourth world title in 2012, Ronnie took a year off, but he returned to the Crucible 12 months ago and it was like he'd never been away. Winning a fifth world title was his greatest triumph, and Andy caught up with him again to hear how he did it. Going into the World Championships, there was so much pressure on you. I think the mm. book has made you about eight to one or seven to one to win it. Yeah, You're smiling like there. Yeah, yeah. Why? Why do you laugh at that? Well, I just think you know. I mean, for people to kind of, kind of talk about you as being like one of the favourites to win it, and 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 especially coming from other players as well, saying, well, you know, it's not so hard. He's only been out for nine, ten months. You know, it's just I just kind of thought it was just unlikely that I was going to win it. Was there a moment in that first round match against Marcus where you hit a bit of form and you thought, you know what, I've still got it, it's still there? Yeah, the first the first eight frames I played OK and I thought, mm, not, not too bad. Um, but to be fair, you know, it was, it was only the first round and there was still that part of me that thought, well, it's only going to get tougher now. And um, obviously Ali Carter, I played him the year before in the final, so... It was a tough second round match. Was it good to have that test? Because retrospectively, when you look back at your route to the final, that was the hardest match you had. Yeah, no, absolutely. You know, I knew that Ali's the type of player that plays well at Sheffield. He's got a great technique. He can kind of, he's got a, the game to just keep churning out breaks and plays with a lot of accuracy. I remember being pegged back to about 7 all or something like that. And then I remember just pulling away five frames and I remember the final session of that match, it was the first time I felt like a snooker player. Yeah. Ronnie O'Sullivan, the people's champion, is through to the quarterfinals. By the time you get to about the quarterfinals, you can walk into the practice room and you can go, he's done, he's got a bit left in him. He's definitely done. <laughs> what do you elaborate? What do you mean? Well, you done? can just see in their demeanour and their body language and their face. You can just see that they're, you know, I pick up on stuff. I don't know what it is, but I can just smell it. And uh, so when you get to the one table set up, 
it becomes so much more intense and you're always looking for, for, for a chink in someone's armour, whether it's on a practice table, whether it's watching them. You, you, I'm watching like a hawk. You're always looking for weakness. And once you find a weakness, you attack. Um, some people don't have a weakness, like John Higgins, Stephen Indry, so I give up with them. I was like, they ain't got a weakness. <laughs> the only way to beat these guys is to go hard, go hard, stay hard, and just right to the last minute, you just throw everything at them. And if they still beat you, you, at least you threw everything at them, and that's the only way you get through them. Whereas everybody else, probably including myself, there is a chink, and if you can get to it and you can exploit it, it can make your job that little bit easier. What's yours? Well, it used to be my head. It used to be my head, I mean, but, but I've worked hard on that since working with Steve Peters, and it was kind of a weakness for me, um, but I always had the talent to play in anger. I could always, and in some ways, I used to have to get myself fired up to stop me thinking about my own weaknesses, if you like. So I'd play a lot in anger and frustration. People go, oh, it was great, but it wasn't great. I was just, I was just so fired up that it would work for one match, two matches, three matches, but then it would run out and you'd kind of then be left with, like I said, I get to the semis and I was done. I was one of them guys that was not ready to go the extra two steps because I'd spent too much energy trying to fire myself up. Do you look back with horror yeah. at what you used to do? I remember you counting the dots on a, yeah. a teaspoon. I remember you putting a towel on your head and yeah. clawing your face when yeah. you were playing Peter yeah. Yeah. Do you look back now and go, like, I can't even believe I did that? <laughs> Well, what's happening here? Ronnie O'Sullivan has shaken Stephen Hendry's hand. Sorry, no. And he's leaving the arena. Can we do? Unbelievable. I understand why I've done it. I'd panic. I think, oh, my game's not right. But why, how, why would you come up with that? Because that's how I felt. And, and, and like Steve. You don't believe in yourself? No, I had no belief. I'd, I, well, I had a belief, but they were negative beliefs. So, you know, you're highlighting three or four matches there, but I've probably had hundreds of matches where I felt like walking out, but I didn't. I just kind of got through, whereas when the World Championship was over this year, I was like, oh, I want to keep going. Whereas before, it was like, relief, it's over. Where now I'm like, oh, I could do another 17 days. I'm ready, I'm fresh. So let's talk about the final now, Barry Hawkins. Was that a surprise? Mm -hmm. For Barry to get to the final, it wasn't a surprise. What I was surprised about was how well he played because I know how well I played. And I, I don't think I've ever played as well as that over a two-day period. But the one thing that kind of kept me in control of the match was every time he came back to me, got to within a frame or two frames, the, the pressure would, would inevitably mount because he, you know, he was getting back close and he would miss a ball and bang, I was away again. And I'd win two or three frames and then I was four frames up again. And I always knew in the back of my mind it's very difficult to keep catching someone up and then they pull away. And then you catch them up and they pull away. In the end, you just go, oh, I can't keep mounting these efforts. So in the back of my mind, I just felt, just keep applying the pressure, applying the pressure, and, and hopefully it's like a, a nut, it just cracks. And then you get to the point where you go, this is mine. And then you just, and then you just kind of just full steam ahead. Of course, the last one goes down, and you're world champion again for the mm. fifth time, mm. and it's just over your right shoulder there. Yeah, and um, we're not long away until you have to defend it again, mm. going for a hat trick on the bounce. That will be six, which means next year could be seven, equaling Stephen Andrews. Mm. Well, what are you looking at now? Are you looking at eight? Are you looking at six? Where are you looking? At? Oh, it's quite funny because when I won the one in 2012, as I was walking through the after party, Stephen went, "Only you got another four to go," and I went. Ugh. When he said that to me, I was like, one's hard enough. And then he, he kind of just hit me with a bit... I'm not sure whether he was tactically doing it, but it was like a bit of a reality check. It was like, I've, just, I've done four. It's taken me 11 <laughs> years to get there. Every one of them has been a grind. And now he's telling me I've got another four to do. And it was like, hold on, I've got to get perspective. And, and I always remember the days when I was 10, 11, walking around programs with me queue, you know, going to Pontins. You know, playing in every snooker event, playing all sorts of players, getting beat, thinking I'm never going to make it, these guys are just so good. And then you kind of like, you mature, and then I'm shaving at 14 and knocking in 147s at 15, and I'm thinking like, you know, it, it, and so when you look back on that journey, I just think I never believed that I was ever going to achieve a quarter 
of what I what I've achieved. So to start thinking, oh, I want to beat Henry's record. No, I have to get perspective and think, I've had a result. I've had a result where I'm. It'd be nice to beat Stephen Hendry's record. It'd be nice to equal Stephen Hendry. But let's have it right. I mean, if I retired today or didn't play another game of snooker, everyone would say, you know what? He ain't done bad. But if I am to do it, I want it to be fun. I want it to be enjoyable. I want it. To, I want to do it with a smile on my face. I want to entertain the fans. I want to play a, a type of snooker that people go, you know what? That was great to watch. I want to excite people. I want to excite myself. And I think that's the way I like to play. That's the way I like to perform. So it's, it's kind of. I'm going to try and do it on my own terms, if you like. If it happens, great. If it doesn't, I'm going to, you know, I'll, I'll give it a, a, the best shot I could ever give it. That's it for now, but be sure to stay tuned to Eurosport for all the latest from the 2014 World Snooker Championship. We'll be back in the summer with more from the Rocket, with plenty more insight, interviews and top tips from the man himself. Until then, it's goodbye for now.